Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janine Adams from the Nelson Mandela University, and my talk is on the current ecological state of the St. Lucia Umphalosi estuary. And this is South Africa's largest estuary. It makes up 60% of the total estuary area in the country. And the system has had a long history of environmental change, as well as human intervention, which makes it a very interesting system to study. And we can also learn a lot from what has happened in the past. I would like to acknowledge Isimangalisa Wetland Park Authority, Ezimvelo KZN Wildlife, and um, the people who have helped me in, with fieldwork over the years, Ricky Taylor for all his inputs, as well as Coriana Julie. She is busy with her MSc study on changes in mangroves in the St. Lucia system. Um, this talk that I'm about to give, uh, parts of it was presented by invitation to present at the Isimangalisa Wetland Park Symposium. This was held in October this year. It was on the state of the St. Lucia functional zone, looking at social, economic and conservation related challenges, threats and opportunities. In preparing this talk, I've also drawn from some recent publications. These were published in our special issue of African Journal of Aquatic Science. There's three recent publications in 2020 on St. Lucia. And then I've also drawn on my own uh, history of research at St. Lucia, starting in the early days, looking at the vegetation of the system, epiphytes, understanding changes in the mangroves over time, looking at the microalgae in response to umphalosi inputs, understanding epilithic diatoms, and also a publication on mangroves. St. Lucia has a long history of research as well because of all of its dynamic, interesting changes. And there's approximately 331 published journal articles on the system, 66 reports, 32 book chapters, and an entire book on the ecology and conservation of the estuarine ecosystem. So I'm just giving you a glimpse into some of the information from my viewpoint in this talk. I said the talk was about the St. Lucia Umphalosi system because although there was a long history of managing sep them separately, they were historically one connected wetland estuary system. So here we have Umphalosi, Umzunduzi, and on the right hand side, the St. Lucia system flowing out into the Indian Ocean. The characteristics just looking at St. Lucia is that it consists of different compartments, the mouth connecting it to the sea, the long thin narrows, South Lake, North Lake and False Bay. The length from the bottom of the mouth up to North Lake is about 70 kilometers and it's a shallow system, no deeper than about 9.9 meters although this obviously changes in response to rainfall and freshwater inflow. Rainfall, we're definitely in the subtropical part of South Africa, so it's about 1,000 millimetres per annum, and evaporation a higher, which obviously leads to a water deficit. Nationally, when we look at estuary, St. Lucia is of high biodiversity importance because it covers a large area and because it's so ecologically diverse does, however, also have very high socio-economic importance, and some of these aspects were identified and studied in the JEF project. Services supplied by St. Lucia would be things such as its contribution to fisheries, the fishing communities and the anglers. Goods would be natural resource harvesting, such as making goods from the surrounding reeds and sedges that grow in the wetlands, and tourism is very important with the economic benefit to both residents and tourists. Crops, particularly sugarcane, is a major industry surrounding the system. There was a major threat to the biodiversity and ecological health of St. Lucia. And this was in 1989 when dune mining was planned for that area between um, the lake and the sea, the dune cordon. And this is pictures of dune mining at Inchlebarn, which shows the high amount of water used in this process. Uh, it has a hydrological disturbance. This was Inchlebarn Lake on the surrounding system. And at that time, St. Lucia was on a, a recorded as a Ramsar wetland, a wetland of international importance. The estuary was placed on the Montreux record to show that its future status and health was now threatened by various activities, in this case mining, and there was a big um, 
a lot of discussion. I was about to say a big fight. But at the end of the day, conservation won. And this was based on sense of place. Mining would have destroyed the sense of place of the system. And from then on, the objective was to manage St. Lucia as a conservation area. And one of the major first steps towards that was to remove forestry on the eastern shores. So the Isimangalisu Wetland Park, St. Lucia, a World Heritage Site, was declared. There's been, to understand St. Lucia, though, we have to look at its long history of um, human interventions and environmental changes. And so it said that sugarcane farming started in about 1911. The very rich floodplains of the wetland would have been a very viable option to grow crops as, such as sugarcane on. Then the schematic also shows that the estuary has gone through a lot of wet, dry cycles, one of them between 1940 and 1951. At that stage already there were interventions to keep the St. Lucia mouth separate from the Umphalosi mouth. There was another dry cycle that followed that. There were flooding events. Uh, there were a number of engineering interventions to try and keep the St. Lucia mouth open to the sea. But Cyclone Demonia in 1984, where some of the flow was 16,000 cubic meters per second, that destroyed a lot of these hard engineering structures and reset the estuary. Then we come to the period 2002 to 2012, which was an extreme drought. There was a lot of research done during that period. And um, the mouth of the estuary at that stage, the management objective was to keep it closed and the system dried out. It was a severe state of desiccation. So these are just some pictures showing the wet dry cycle. This is Charters Creek in February 2006 and the same area in July 2020. So St. Lucia has always been characterized by water level extremes, salinity extremes from fresh water to hypersaline and fluctuations in sediments, both in the water and the substrate. These are some states that can be identified for the system. So whatever state it is, it's going to influence the biota. So you could have an open hypersaline state, a closed hypersaline, a closed state where there is a salinity gradient, a closed state where it's freshwater dominated. There will be a lot of freshwater inflow. A state where it's open to the sea, but it's now marine water, a state where it's marine and hypersaline, just showing that we're looking at cycles in the specific. System. These are some earlier photographs. So to manage a system, where has it come from? We want to understand what did it look like so many years ago. And in, this is one of the first pictures from 1877, where you can see a shared St. Lucia Bay, the Umphalosi and the St. Lucia forming one big bay area in the mouth. 1905 Crofts map shows that very clearly, but there was already some canalization. Sugarcane started in around 1911, and there was a map from 1937. This 2013 image shows clearly um, the St. Lucia, uh, the Umphalosi system, where the mouth separated from St. Lucia, and from 1952 to 2002, the mouths were actively separated through a dredging program, and they would be artificially breached to keep them opening to the sea and separated. A lot of that dredge spoil was deposited on the south of the St. Lucia mouth between the St. Lucia and Umphalosi system. One of the reasons for keeping them separate was that the Umphalosi introduced a lot of sediment, a lot of salt rich water to the St. Lucia system. And one of the reasons for that is because the catchment area is no longer natural vegetation, it's sugar cane, and so it doesn't function as effectively as a natural wetland in where sediments can be deposited and floodwaters can be attenuated. This is unlike Umkuzi, which still has some natural wetland function. So a summary of some of these historical events, so dredging occurring during that period, Cyclone Des Moines 1984, drought conditions 2002 to 2012, there was another drought event between 2015 and 2016. Then 2016 to 2017 was when the GEF project was implemented, the Global Environmental Facility Project. And here, dredge spoil was removed to relink the Umphalosi to St. Lucia, so that Umphalosi water could flow into St. Lucia and it can once again become an aquatic system. 
And here we are now in 2020, where St. Lucia is a freshwater salty state with high water level in the Narrows. So this is St. Lucia, what it looked like under drought conditions, where the system became very compartmentalized. So the Narrows were separated from the South Lake, from the North Lake, it was a dry desiccated environment, and there were some losses in invertebrates and fish. Water level recorders were sitting high and dry. The Global Environmental Facility Project then funded under the management of Isilang Mangalisa Wetland Park Authority a study to look at different options for the future restoration of the system. It was an analysis of alternatives to determine the most feasible solution to the hydrological issues of the Lake St. Lucia estuarine system. Three options were considered and modeled and studied in detail, and that was to actively facilitate a single mouth between the two systems, to do nothing, to just leave nature take control, or to maintain separate umphalosi and St. Lucia mouths. After a lot of study, option three was decided on to facilitate a joint mouth by removing dredger spoil. That's where the dredger spoil had been deposited historically to not open the mouths artificially, but rather to allow for breaching at a high water level. That always results in a greater removal of sediment and thereafter a better functioning um, so this sh photo shows the Jeff Project spoil removal being done between June 2016 and June 2017. Here are a lot of vehicles on the beach. The sediment, the old dredge spoil was removed from this area and it was pumped into the sea. Part of that study also recommended that as part of these rehabilitation activities, it was important to rehabilitate the floodplain areas of both Umphalosi and Umkuz by removing alien vegetation and natural structures and recreating riparian buffers in the agricultural areas upstream. This was to act as sediment and nutrient traps for the downstream estuarine environment. Also to increase the protection of natural resources. The objective was to try what could you do to improve the ecological health of the estuarine system. And these three characteristics or management actions were identified. And then importantly, to secure water requirements. An estuary is dependent on freshwater inflow. And that would be done by establishing the environmental flows for all the inflowing rivers, reducing forestry in the catchment, which takes up a lot of water, and addressing land degradation in the catchment. The study also recommended comprehensive monitoring that should take place. We cannot manage a system if we don't have data on which to manage and base our decisions on. Monitoring was to cover ecological aspects, some economic aspects such as tourism, status and activities of local communities, and then compliance monitoring in terms of resource utilization as over exploitation of resources and illegal fishing and use of gill nets is an issue. So the, the Jeff project, as we said, yeah, just showing our historical timeline again. This is a photo from 2019. This is showing after the dredge um, spoil removal and the connection of the two systems with water flowing in from the Umphalosi system into St. Lucia. This has introduced a, a large amount of silt into the system, but it has improved water level and water level is now mostly greater than a meter in the Narrows. This graph shows water level and salinity data for the Narrows. There's a water level recorder on the bridge from 2004 to 2020. The blue is salinity, and here we can see a peak in salinity at 35, that would be seawater in 2007 and 2008, small overtopping event in 2013, but thereafter a decrease in salinity, so that now the Narrows is completely fresh. It's no saline water as a system, both the Umphalosi and the St. Lucia remain close to the, close to the sea. With the increase in water from Umphalosi, of course, the water level rose in the Narrows, and this red um, line shows the increase in water level, particularly since 2016, it has gone greater than one meter. So one of the ecological responses to that high water level has been the dieback of the mangroves. Mangroves usually grow in intertidal habitats, tidal habitats, salty habitats, 
which would have been promoted when the estuary was dredged and kept open to the sea. But now that the mouth is closed and the water level is high, the mangroves are flooded. The pneumatophils or the aerial roots become flooded and they die back in response to that. Also, other plants are now encroaching into the mangrove habitat. Here we see a big herb understory and the reeds. They prefer fresher com conditions and they start, start to outcompete the mangroves. Other changes in plants or habitats have been the submerged macrophytes and reeds. So while we have a dieback of mangroves, submerged macrophytes have grown as well as reeds. And um, this shows some of Typha capensis or bulrush at Charters Creek and Phragmites australis or the common reed growing in the mouth area. This shows under drier conditions in 2010, not much habitat for submerged macrophytes, but salt marsh would have grown in some of the exposed areas. Now that the water level is higher, you can get an expansion of the submerged plants, the plants that grow rooted in the substrate with their leaves in the water. And here we see very large beds of pondweed or Stichinia pectinata occurring in 2019. This shows reed growth that has occurred in Honeymoon Bend. The reeds have expanded in response to the salty nutrient rich water, the shallowing of the system and uh, by 2019, most of that area that was still exposed in 2010 has been covered by thick reed and sedge growth. We've also done some studies on the microalgal response. These are unicellular plants growing in the water column. And uh, Monique Nunez's study looked at microalgal and physicochemical data, particularly in response to freshwater pulses from the Umfalozi River in 2014 and 2015. The idea was to try and understand what would the Umfalozi water bring into the St. Lucia system. And certainly because the catchments under agriculture, there was an increase in nutrients, dissolved inorganic nitrogen and phosphate. There was also an increase in cyanophytes and dinoflites and um, some harmful algal bloom species such as Purocentrum minimum. They usually respond to the high nutrient concentrations and Monique published a number of papers on these changes. The agricultural nutrient inputs also stimulate the growth of invasive alien aquatic plants. These are things such as water hyacinth, azolla, and here we see spiradella as well. These invasive alien aquatic plants are usually floating and they increase in response to nutrient rich waters. One thing about them though is that they like fresh water, so you usually don't find them under saline conditions, but they tend to grow and proliferate under freshwater conditions. So they were both of these species were observed in the mouth area of St. Lucia in 2019. Invertebrate changes have also been recorded in the mouth area. And here Jones et al. looked at conditions prior to 2017 and after 2017. And they found that the native gastropod, the snail Asimonea, had been replaced by an invasive alien freshwater gastropod, Terebia. These studies were about two years ago, so it's important that more updated data on the current ecological state are also provided and reported on. Because uh, the mouth has remained close to the sea, in terms of the fish, there's no marine migrants or marine species in the system. The fish composition is dominated by two freshwater fish species. This is the sharp tooth catfish and the Mozambique tilapia, and the redfish tilapia is shown in this picture. There's also been changes in birds, and Taylor's count in February 2020 showed a large number of birds, 13,000, occurring mostly in North Lake, where there's a high diversity of different habitat types, shallow areas, small islands for the birds to congregate and then in full space and smaller numbers in the other areas. The paleartic wader numbers, however, were low, and this is because the exposed shoreline and mudflat habitat is now limited because of the higher water level. Hippos and crocs, what is their current state? They seem to be less abundant in the mouth area. Initially, a muddy substrate affects their movement. However, as some of these sediments may become consolidated over time. This might change. So the summary of where are we in 2020? Certainly the estuary is in a freshwater state. It has a high silt content. It's very shallow. Here are the flamingos in the mouth area. Uh, there are signs of nutrient enrichment from the umphalosi catchment, which results in higher microalgal biomass. 
There's an increase in plants such as reeds and submerged macrophytes because of the greater water surface area and the fresher conditions. There's a dieback of mangroves because of flooding. And there's been changes in fish, invertebrate and bird composition and responses. So this shows the activities that have taken place. This is where we are now. So what do we need to open the mouth? The mouth should not be artificially breached. We need to wait for a large event to open the mouths of these estuaries to the sea. Smaller floods might come and that could cause some issues in that it could deposit debris and sediment uh, disconnecting St. Lucia and Umphalosi. Also the vegetation could act as a barrier for movement of waters up into the lake system. So a large event is needed to flush out the sediment that is accumulated in the mouth area and we need to re-establish a bay area with clearer water, such as was observed in Cyclone Des Moines. In conclusion, this is my final slide that shows for any estuary and St. Lucia in particular, we need to manage it as a socio-ecological system. I have uh, presented some information on the ecological helpful state that needs to be linked to ecosystem services and state of the societal system, which then looks at human benefits social, economic, personal benefits and values. When we consider restoration, it has to be done in a strategic adaptive management cycle. So you have a restoration goal and there has been some restoration management action implementation at St. Lucia. But this has to be followed by monitoring in a strategic adaptive management cycle so that decisions can be made. We're in a dynamic system and we need to address that in a dynamic way. Thank you very much. And please do follow us on social media to get an update on our current research activities. Thank you.